We're here to discuss climate resilience and Web3. I have an incredible array of panelists building different solutions within this space. Um, but first off, my name is Tim. I'm managing partner at Marie Score Ventures. Uh, we are an early stage impact fund uh, focused on climate resilience and financial resilience. Um, today, I'll be moderating this great panel. Uh, so I'll let each person introduce themselves really briefly, and then we'll we'll dig into it. Go ahead. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Gregory Landway. I am the CEO of R&D Public Benefit Corp uh, and the co-founder of Regen Network. Hi, everybody. I'm Mercedes Vidart. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kipu Bank, and we're building a digital decentralized bank for the informal economy in Latin America. So. Hello, I'm Nirvan Ranganathan from the Climate Collective. I'm the program manager there. Uh, we are an innovation network that supports companies building at this intersection of Web3 and climate. And I'm Claire Gagne. I'm the CEO of Range Carbon. We work with project developers to bring tools uh, to uh, help carbon markets come to life. Wonderful. So yeah, we have a diversity of panelists kind of building at different intersections of climate resilience within Web3. And as a little bit of background of how we approach this, um, you know, as a fund, we're exclusively focused on, again, on climate resilience and financial resilience. Um, a lot of the way we approach it are what are the different types of technologies, services, and models uh, that can help uh, those who are least responsible for climate change to uh, build their adaptive capacity to confront it over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, Web3 is one of those trends, tools, uh, technologies, movements, I can, can characterize it in that way, I guess, all of those, uh, that we're particularly excited about, um, you know, as a coordination tool, as uh, the ability to bring in a variety of voices and stakeholders together to coordinate, you know, billions of dollars of economic activity um, and work. Uh, the crypto space, the Web3 space is this bubbling um area where a lot of that is happening. And so I think when we look at climate resilience and all sorts of interesting uh, tools and applications uh, being built on Web3, there's, there's these early signals uh, that some of this could be quite transformative. How that reaches emerging markets um, and those types of users, it's still relatively early and something we're going to discuss uh, a little bit today because, again, there's some signals there, but then there's also a lot of hype um, towards what can actually happen. Uh, so we're excited to kind of uh, dig into that a little bit in this panel. Um, and again, we're going to be exploring a few different dimensions of this and kind of survey, surveying the Web3 regenerative finance space. Um, we have uh, individuals building in the carbon markets, ecosystem services. Uh, we have individuals working decentralized finance, uh, which has uh, maybe a more indirect climate angle. Uh, and then we have others that are, are kind of working more broadly across a variety of initiatives around plastics, uh, around data unions for scientific data. Um, so this is hopefully kind of a taste of what's happening in Web3, uh, but we hope you'll join us later tonight for a happy hour at Cello headquarters, or continue the conversation uh, on Twitter, online, and some resources that we'll share at the end. Um, so first, I wanted to ask Gregory, um, you know, one of the things that I think is thrown a lot uh, around a lot is, you know, crypto, uh, blockchain, Web3, everything's used interchangeably. Uh, we don't always have kind of a common definition of what this means. Um, so Gregory, I'd love if you kind of just describe, you know, what is Web3, and then also, um, you know, how how did you approach building Regen Network utilizing this tool? Like, how did you kind of uh, describe that journey a little bit? Yeah. Um, to start, I'll just say, I uh, uh, upon founding Regen Network, I would not have characterized myself as a technologist. I was um, a farmer and a permaculturalist and a uh, community activist, but um, was quite skeptical of technology and pretty skeptical of um, blockchain as some magic fairy dust that was going to fix things. Um, and so just as far as like where I've come from, and I'll share a little bit about the journey of choosing to really engage and go all in on Web3. So it's just a little ba background. Um, so to me, Web 3.0 is really the leap towards social computation. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that the, the fundamental and intrinsic characteristic of a blockchain is that there is consensus that's being maintained by a, a network of computers a, about a particular um, state of data. 
And in Bitcoin, that's used to it in a very limited capacity, right? It's sort of like this first generation attempt to maintain a distributed ledger for units of account moving between counterparties without a centralized party that's controlling the whole system. But if you think deeper than that, what's happening is it's a, it, it's a social computing system that's maintaining consensus about what that community finds is important. So if we, if we take another step forward, what are the things that we as humans need to maintain statefulness or have consensus about um, as communities in order to effectively coordinate our action, right? And, and finance um, and markets are an enormous coordination tool. There are also other coordination tools like um, governance, decision-making, um, all of these in some way can be radically empowered by creating social computers, by adding in some layer of consensus between compute nodes that allows us to then essentially start as, as human communities to govern programs, to govern algorithms, to govern the tools that we're using computationally to achieve ends, whether those are market ends or or democratic ends, or policy ends, other decision making. So sort of found it foundationally and fundamentally from, from sort of that way of thinking about things, first principles, we at Region Network came to the, the conclusion that what's needed deeply to confront the climate crisis, or even more importantly, the e environmental and ecological degradation crisis, which is really the, that's the real thing, Climate is just the symptom of that. We need to be able to symbolically represent ecological health and create community consensus about that that is deeply legitimate, in which stakeholders are owning and participating in the process, in which communities can monitor and govern the whole stack of that process. And um, that's why, after a lot of thinking about this and and um, and even trying other approaches, we came to the conclusion that we really needed to create sort of a Web3 stack, a, a blockchain stack for the purposes of um, what currently is being used to monitor, report, verify, and issue things like carbon credits, right? But to do so from this set of first principles where we're saying in order for those to be deeply valuable, we need to maintain the statefulness. We need to make sure that the right people are participating at different moments. And we need to do that all, and this is what I think is very unique, on public infrastructure, right? That's open source in which the value accrual mechanisms and the way that investors get paid back isn't by trying to extract value from sort of like the use of that infrastructure. Instead, that people can repurpose it, build on it, own it, and operate it as user stakeholders. So um, hopefully that's kind of what you were hoping that I'd go for, and I'm happy always <laughs> to go deeper. Yeah, thank you very much. No, we'll, we'll definitely go deeper. Uh, Nirvan, wanted to kind of shift over to you. I'd love to hear a little bit more about Climate Collective and then the types of uh, projects and solutions you guys are interacting with. Sounds great. Uh, so at Climate Collective, our mission is to create a trusted and liquid market for digital environmental assets at scale. Uh, and we abbreviate that as DEA, but it's all to say, it's not saying that it's carbon offsets or anything like that, it's a digital environmental asset. And I think as Gregory said, I mean, need this symbolic representation of environmental assets. Otherwise, I mean, it can't really be analog. I think that is one starting point for us is that we need to update our systems that are able to track ecological assets um, in a far more robust way than we've been doing so far. So uh, I'll start with, I would say the high level ecosystem and then talk about Climate Collective's role there. Uh, similar to most markets, you know, there's supply, there's demand, and then there's the point where they meet in the middle. Uh, so in terms of supply, uh, as I mentioned, I mean, things have started very much with the carbon markets, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, but a lot of projects that are using kind of the precedent that we already have called the voluntary carbon market uh, to essentially use, the, uh, use Web3 tools to streamline that market. So. You have nature-based, tech-based credits from different companies, such as you know, some of these names may be familiar, Toucan Protocol, Flow Carbon, uh, Sanergy, Thalo. You can see there's quite a 
mass of folks who are working on carbon projects. Uh, but then we also have, as Tim was alluding to earlier, let's say real world assets like whether it's plastics, e-waste, uh, renewable energy financing, uh, and to Gregory's point, uh, biodiversity and really being able to measure uh, what is the ecological state of an area beyond using carbon as a proxy for planetary health. Uh, so a lot of different sides of supply, uh, trying to think of it somewhat holistically. Uh, and then moving over to the demand side, I would say this is a the North Star that has been guiding a lot of the thinking and the, and the practice here is comes from Charles Eisenstein's Sacred Economics, where he lays out an argument for essentially, instead of using the gold standard or uh, previous uh, collateral systems, can we back money by things we care more about, like forests and clean rivers and, and so on. Uh, so this idea of being able to use these digital environmental assets to collateralize stable currencies that are in, uh, in circulation. Uh, so that's, I would say, one really guiding principle that will be a huge source of demand uh, as, as um, digital currency continues to be adopted. Uh, others are, let's say, things like FlyWallet, where uh, on, a lot of us took flights here. I'm sure some, maybe some subset of us have offset the travel. Uh, but it's not very easy in the current system, where you see it on Google as an externality, as uh, we were kind of alluding to earlier, uh, where you're essentially embedding this carbon neutrality or climate positivity into other applications, whether that's transportation, um, more crypto native, let's say NFT projects, uh, and so on. So you're, you're essentially creating this supply, uh, sparking the demand for it, and then where they meet in the middle. So some assets may be more suitable for, let's say, crypto native trading in what they call liquidity pools. Some folks might want an order book system that is more familiar. Uh, with regulated assets. Some assets may be more suitable for an auction mechanism. So really figuring out what makes the most sense to be able to connect the suppliers and the buyers uh, in this uh, very nascent market. Uh, and what is the Climate Collective's role here? We, so on a general level, we provide you know, grant capital, uh, technical advice, marketing support, and let's say learning uh, experiences for our members and grantees. Uh, but I think the unique thing that we do is identify and execute on these opportunities for integration between the supply and the demand side, or even within uh, multiple organizations that are in the collective. Um, one very simple example I'll give there is Project A has developed a tokenized carbon offset project, which you're able to retire, and that's, and that's great. Uh, but it's not terribly exciting after that. It's saying, OK, I have this blockchain transaction where I've retired eight tons of carbon. Now project B wants to come and say, says, hey, I want to build a game on top of this that unlocks a certain uh, level or attribute or something like that. If the user has offset, proves to me that they've offset X amount of carbon. Uh, so being able to plug in, I mean, that's, gaming is a very simple example. There's a lot more uh, where that came from. But uh, this is this idea of being able to build interoperably and composably, I think, are core tenets of Web3. Uh, so that's where I see Climate Collective being uh, very valuable, adding value and utility to each of these different protocols and to the general, uh, to the space. Great, thanks. And uh, Claire, I wanted to turn it over to you because you're not coming from, you know, kind of a Web3 native uh, perspective here. Um, but I'd love if you could speak to, you know, what Range Carbon is doing to equalize access uh, for project developers to the carbon markets. And then from that perspective, um, you know, where do you see currently or in the future Web3 potentially playing a role in what you do? Thanks, Tim. So um, I am sort of one of those people who's been in the carbon markets forever, um, but I took a 14-year hiatus. So back when I was in grad school, I studied carbon markets, fell in love with them, um, decided I was going to go work in technology, which I did for 14 years, and then picked my head up last year and said, oh my gosh, there's so much happening in the carbon markets. This is great. I can't wait to get back in. And through that journey, what was thrilling to me was how much had changed. Um, most notably, the demand is just incredible. And it really creates the potential for the carbon markets to realize the dream that they've always contained. But also, I found that actually carbon project development is just as hard as it ever has been, even though I've been gone for you know, a decade and a half. 
which from the Silicon Valley perspective I bring is crazy. Um, it's mind blowing to me that that's still as difficult as it is. Um, and so that's what Range Carbon is really working on. Uh, we work with project developers who, whether they are, have been project developers for a long time or are trying to get into project development, um, they're struggling with the many hoops that they need to clear over the course of years. I mean, I don't know how much, how much you are familiar with bringing a project to life, but it really does take years, and there's a ton of financial risk involved, which maybe is something that you do understand <laughs> from your vantage point. And so what Range Carbon is, is working on is, um, really, you could call it workflow tools, but it's, it's much more than that, um, born out of the real world experiences of project developers in the field who are trying to figure out how they work with communities to do the interventions they need to do on an ecosystem. We work exclusively with project developers who, who deal in ecosystems um, and then bring those carbon credits to life um, in a way that they can be saleable. Um, and what is so exciting to me about Web3, but also the reason that Range Carbon isn't a Web3 uh, native platform, is that Web3 has within it the ability to embed metadata about those projects that really isn't possible to do in Web2. It, it, you know, you can include all that information, but it takes many websites or glossy brochures or many meetings with people, and those things are still important and they have their place. But being able to actually put that information in an indelible way into a, a credit has a ton of value uh, for the ecosystem at large, including the project developer. Um, so we're really working up the chain um, from like what Regen is doing as well as Climate Collective um, on the supply side. And just to anchor this, like we are driving in reverse right now when it comes to ecosystem protection um, and restoration. In 2020 alone, we lost 25 million acres of established ecosystems and only 10 million acres of projects were brought online. Granted, those are also often interventions that where something has already been clear cut, right? So it's not as good of a forest or an ecosystem as one that's been established. Project developers need help, they really do. And technology has a lot to offer, um, but no one's really building that. So we decided we would step in. Great, thanks Claire. And you know, recognizing that um, within the carbon markets, there's you know 30 years of history with that, a whole lot going on. You know, we've kind of talked about some of these topics, but you know, again, afterwards, we can, I'm sure everybody would be happy to dive in more um, because there's kind of a lot of nuance and, and technicalities. And then also uh, looking at how those types of tools reach smaller, smaller land stewards. So a lot more to dig into. And we'll also have time for Q&A. Please do feel free to use the app to type in any questions you have, but we can sync them to the, uh, the, the panelists as well. Mercedes, I want to turn it over to you. Um, I think, you know, again, when we were forming this panel, we wanted to make sure we avoided just kind of carbon tunnel vision <laughs> and only focusing on, like I'd say, the most direct linkages between Web3 and climate. Um, and so I've known you and Kipo Markets for a few years. And I'd love to, if you could describe a little bit more about what you're building, uh, why Web3 is a part of it versus picking another strategy, and then how you think about how climate relates to that. Yeah, sure. So I will start with the last part. <laughs> um, yeah, like we are really in a different segment. So we are working on financial inclusion and technology uh, for the emerging markets. So it's really working with uh, micro businesses that don't have access to the formal financial system. So we, we are starting in Colombia where just 9% of micro businesses access formal credit. And, and really, there's a big gap of information. There's where we started, like how we can assess credit worthiness in a completely alternative way and, you know, start to use the smartphones and the internet in a way um, to get this data that uh, it's around, but actually people are not monetizing it, right? Like they are not accessing better services. Uh, and that's there's where we tap in. Um, why I got into it, so I'm a city planner and political scientist, so I'm not coming from the financial sector. And why I you know, got into the financial uh, sector is, and this has to do with your climate question, is because uh, you know, the banks have their, the decision of the world we are living in right now. 
right? Like the world we are living in right now where like some projects were funded uh, decades ago or years ago uh, is because where they decided the money to flow, right? So I think like the money flow of the world is like deciding a lot how we will see our future. And if we want to see a future, uh, you know, with better um, biodiversity and like uh, and, and to challenge climate change and to have more uh, equity, then we need to decide where the money is flowing. And, and that's why I'm like working on that right now. Um, and, and basically, as, as a city planner, what I've seen is that in cities, um, you know, there's a big percentage of our cities that are informal, not just in informal housing, but in informal economy, right? Um, so just in Latin America, 51% of our economy is informal. And by by being so, then we cannot like understand it, right? Like we cannot create better services and, and it is very difficult to bridge that gap um, for these uh, businesses and people to have more, to build wealth, right? Like because in the end it's building wealth. Um, so there's where we started building Kipu as a, as a bank, as I said, that where we um, really meet the user where the user is and it's like you know now nowadays uh micro businesses sell on their phones so we basically built a platform where they can upload their in web 2 so this platform is in web 2 for the user so it's like you know they can upload what they're selling pictures of their products of their business uh they upload their main customers so they tell us like who are who is that like social capital capital that they have locally because they usually sell uh, locally in the same neighborhood or same city. And based on all that information is that we use AI to assess great worthiness. So that is all on Web2. Um, and, and then we said, okay, one of the main challenges that we have as a lending platform is to access capital, right? Um, like you need capital. Money is like our uh, fuel and we need it to exist because it's what we are selling, right, to our, our clients. Um, and if you go to get debt like in the traditional way, kind of like institutional debt, and if you're a fintech that is just starting, then you will get debt at really high interest rates. And, and you need to translate that into the final user, right? And then like being poor ends up being extremely expensive because as there's no data of how your business is doing, there's no data of you, then you they end up relying on like really, really high interest rates. So we said we need to change, you wanna really change the way that finance works in this uh, segment, then we need to start from where we get the capital from, at what rates, and how this can be translated into our users. So basically we're, we're building a, a liquidity pool, um, uh, try to, I will try to explain it like uh, plain English. Um, so it's basically like a way in which anybody in the world can invest in these businesses uh, using USDC, which is a stable uh, coin, buying a token that it's not changing on demand and offer, but actually changing on how our businesses are repaying their loan. So we give yields to the lenders. And at the same time, we start backing a token as a reward that comes back to our users, as to the community, actually. Um, and this token is also backed by how our, our cohorts of clients are repaying. So in a way, if you're part of Hibu and you're repaying re your loan, then you get rewarded in a token that is backed in USDC. You are able to save in this, in this token. You are able to pay back the loan or even invest in the pools, right? Um, so in this way, we are, we are able to access capital at better rates, faster from anywhere in the world. And at the same time, we can make our users members of the, lend, of the lending protocol, right? And we expect them to, be, to have governance on the lending plot, uh, protocol and not, not just be always excluded from how the financial and the economic system works, but actually be able to write again those rules of uh, of the economy we're living in, so that's that's our intersection between Web three and and the informal economy and a little bit of climate. Uh, we're, I'm not a climate expert, uh, you know that team, but um, yeah, but the, but I think we need to decide where money is flowing, and that will get into how our future is looking like. Great, thanks so much. Um, want to pick up on a strand there uh, with you, Gregory. Um, you know, the carbon markets are an inflection point. More money than ever is uh, flooding in to purchase offsets and forward contracts. Um, and more money than ever is flooding into tech startups to build in this space. 
um, and more money than ever is flooding into acquire land uh, to uh, develop different projects. All of this has the potential for very negative consequences for smaller land stewards, indigenous communities. Um, how do you look at that tension point between the growth of the carbon markets, um, and which you know again has the potential to uh, really drive forward some of our uh, mitigation and adaptation efforts with the inclusivity of that, the governance of it, and so forth. And yeah, speak a little bit more about, I think, what Mercedes was alluding to, that the stakeholders around the table that you're trying to convene with Regen Network and, and how that, like, again, that architecture of what you've built really tries to contribute to that. Yeah. Um, so let's just sort of, we, we live in a world now in which the financialization of nature is going to happen. And so the, the bigger question is, how is it going to happen? Um, not if it's going to happen. So I think um, the, Tim's question is really fantastic I, because the, the deeper question is, is, are we going to perpetuate, sort of like use the exact same tools and approach and therefore create a subprime carbon collapse at the end of which all of the smallholder farmers and nature preserves and all of the, the where the real work is being done to co combat climate change, the rug gets pulled out from under them in, in the bubble popping. Or are we going to have a scenario in which there, it's substantively different the way that the, the, the market is interfacing with ecosystems and the land stewards who, who care for them. And so at Regen Network, we've worked really hard on that specific problem, right? Because we're not, our assumption is this monster wave of finance is already, it's coming and it's already here. Not that we need to do something to make that happen, but instead that the real work is to make sure that it happens as well as possible. And so Regen Network is secured by a blockchain, right? It's a community. It's secured by a blockchain. That blockchain is sovereign and independent, right? So it's not um, built on Celo or Ethereum or Ripple or some other place where there's existing stakeholders who have existing interests and, and even with good intentions may end up extracting value or governing the system in a way that isn't necessarily fit for the this, the land stewards who are sort of really at the end of the day with their work backing the system and the value. So instead, we built sort of like a, a, a in a blue a, a cyber blue space where we can invite stakeholders in to govern and participate who are actually providing the value. So there's a, a large set aside in the way that things are working for indigenous peoples for the rights of nature, for landscapes themselves to have representation in the governance system, for science groups, for activists, for the, the types of stakeholders who actually, at the end of the day, are the ones who are going to be responsible for the value-adding process that produces these public goods that we all need, that our market needs to, that our market is hungry for, that there's a, more demand than ever for carbon credits and ESG actions. We can't keep up with the demand, right? But in order for there to be deep legitimacy, there's an understanding that that shift has to happen and those people also need to be centered both in the financial upside of the success of everything happening, as well as in, in the governance of the system itself. Um, and so we've tried to sort of bake that into each layer of, of the architecture, the, the business model, the economic model, in order really at the end of the day to sort of future-proof this market, right? So that this monster wave of probably several trillion dollars a year that's going, that is going to be transacted based on conservation, restoration, regeneration, mitigation is really transforming the economy to, to really re put, put people and nature back at the center of things. Thank you. Yeah, Claire, if you could follow up on that a little bit from your perspective, that'd be yeah, great. Absolutely. And I couldn't agree with you more. It's not a matter of if it's how, and, um, one of the things that we're really working towards, um, with range carbon is to develop tools that become easier and easier for different groups to use. So right now, you know, when I last spoke, I 
told you about how hard it is to develop a carbon project, and that's true. And I don't think that that is going to get crazy easy, but it can be eased with technology and with people and know-how. And the goal that we're working towards is for um, smallholders, for indigenous communities to be able to create projects that they can actually monetize off the carbon markets or wherever they go <laughs> beyond carbon, water, biodiversity, soil, etc. Um, and that is something that is completely unavailable to those groups. The ones that are really at the forefront of ecosystem loss and climate change and all of the impacts that come from that. And it makes sense, right? Like, it, you know, it's not just economic terms, but it is easy for us in our Western minds to, to see it that way. But think about it from the perspective of a small indigenous group that is living um, off their land and someone comes to them and says, you know, if you convert this to palm oil and farm it, like we can give you this much money and these resources, et cetera. Like that is really hard to turn down when you're dealing with real struggles and loss of life or lack of education or fresh water. I mean, all the things that we take for granted, those are not available to a lot of the people who are at the forefront of these ecosystems and their loss. And what would be so tragic to me and what we're, I think, all fighting here to avoid is for those very people to be the ones who don't benefit from the carbon markets because they are the ones who have the most to lose and they should be getting something that is meaningful and sustainable and long term out of this transaction that we're creating with, with nature um, so that we can offset our flights and our purchases of clothes and things like that. Um, so. It is absolutely a tension. It is one that we have to reckon with. And one of the things that I'm really excited about um, with that we're working on is a pilot um, with Forest Carbon, which is a, a premium um, conservation project developer, works with peatland restoration in Southeast Asia. They um, sell carbon credits that result from their work. And they have communities who are adjacent to and within their project sites. And like many project developers, the extent of that relationship is actually, it's pretty meaningful. Like they employ, I think it's 96% of the employees that are on their sites are from the actual villages and the communities that are adjacent. Um, but those communities are not actually directly benefiting from the carbon projects and the sale of those carbon credits. And we're working together to figure out how we can first do something like this pilot, which is going to bring in metadata about the co-benefits that are co-created with those communities and then longitudinally tracked over time for impact, so SDG goals that are baked into uh, Forest Carbon's Vera credits at this point. But the long-term goal is to actually have those communities be able to uh, create or at least manage a carbon project themselves and be the beneficiaries entirely of those uh, financial, you know, mechanisms, because that's really what we need to be able to have the sea change that we're all looking for here. Great. Thanks, Claire. And you know, I think there'll be announcements on that pilot in the coming week or two uh, for folks to dig more into, uh, if, if who's more interested. Um, Nirvan, one other question, then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, I'm sure, hopefully, a lot of good questions out there. Um, you know, I think Claire touched on something that's important around transparency, you know, infrastructure for like cross-validating data, uh, payments, obviously. Um, it'd be great if you could speak to a little bit, you know, the work that Celo and then Climate Collective as well are engaging in emerging markets on, you know, beyond kind of the carbon space, the different types of projects, pilots you guys are doing. It's happy to. Um, I'll, I, I'll say I read that as beyond terrestrial carbon. I still think ocean carbon is, well, oceans are like 70% of the world. I don't think we've figured out a good way to uh, to really use them uh, to the uh, to the maximum capacity, and why why is that? Uh, it's incredibly difficult to measure something in the middle of the ocean, of the Pacific Ocean, or something like that. Uh, and I think that's the key piece of this beyond carbon, which is you know we have methodologies at the moment to measure you know the, to a good degree of accuracy what like the number of tons of carbon that have been has been sequestered by a certain project. Uh, renewable energy, you know, maybe just plug in a meter somewhere and you have solved this issue of MRV or measurement reporting and verification. Um, and I think that is the biggest unlock and I, in my opinion the key use case of blockchain here uh, of essentially being able to verify that some action has happened halfway across the world, whether that's uh, a 
whether that's related to a carbon project or beyond. So for example, one, one project I'd like to highlight is called Simplex DNA. Uh, and they call it a proof of life biodiversity monitoring protocol. So for example, you have a backpack here, you're able to take an air or water sample, in theory from the middle of the ocean, uh, and then send it to the closest Simplex DNA lab. They would essentially do, it's called eDNA barcoding. I can't say I understand that fully, but you end up with uh, a, car, a snapshot of what organism, what DNA is in that uh, vicinity, so you'd be able to figure out what organisms are living there. Uh, so a very interesting way to, uh, the science-wise, to be able to quantify biodiversity and kind of sell the changes in biodiversity over time. Uh, but how do you actually measure, and how do you make sure that people are aren't cheating the system? How do you incentivize people to measure it? Uh, so that's one side of the coin, which is. You know, the buyer wants clear data saying, oh, okay, this, the delta is from A to B, the biodiversity state is improved, great. But on the other side, for folks who are actually on the ground collecting it, uh, the, the samples and the data, or whether it's for Simplex DNA or for another project where they're trying to verify that a certain action has indeed happened, um, I mean, to make sure, I, mean, I think the thinking gets very different then. It's not, oh, am I satisfying this buyer's requirements? It's, can I make a living out of this? Of, we've heard you know, a lot of stuff with gaming recently, which kind of came to a bit of a close, but this whole play to earn uh, idea, instead can we make it like measure to earn? Uh, can, I think that's what is more important for folks who are actually, uh, as Gregory was saying, doing the hard work and actually staying on the ground. Uh, so in the Beyond Carbon, I think I alluded to a couple other projects. Uh, in, or other solutions there, which, like for example, plastic, e-waste, um, renewable energy, let's say these are the key um, assets that we're looking at. But all of these, I mean, ultimately, whether it's I plant a tree in India or I collect plastic from Brazil, I sitting here in San Francisco need to know that that happened somehow. Uh, so I think that is the key unlock to the rest of the Beyond Carbon uh, movement, let's say. Uh, but I do think I mean, there's a few foundational things that are coming up, such as Simplex DNA, MRV Collective, Athena Protocol. Uh, I do hope they will all plug nicely into Regen, uh, because just wanted to say there that Regen has just launched its marketplace today. And there was one, my favorite credit there is the Jaguar credit, where you're able to really see like, part of it's protecting endangered species or at-risk species. Uh, so you, we're already starting to see things going beyond carbon. Um, and highly recommend checking out the Regen. Forgot to mention that. <laughs> I had to do it for you, Gregory. <laughs> um, so we're already starting to see that in certain forward-looking groups, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we should say no to carbon. I think Claire is doing excellent work with especially forward-looking carbon. Um, but MRV, those three letters, are key to kind of unlocking the next step in climate action, at least in my perspective. Great. Well, I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. If you have a question, please feel raise your hand, and we'll get a microphone to you. Yeah, hi, my, my name is Neil. Um, I'm in the mental health and wellness space running on the blockchain. And one of the questions I have about um, extractive capital versus regenerative capital models. Um, how do you ensure a regenerative capital model in the blockchain? Because even crypto holders, money dictates power. So how do you separate um, currency ownership with governing power? Um, I think sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. So um, in a very specific way in region network, we've built, for instance, we built a governance um, tool called the groups module, which enables non-token based voting um, for either specific parameters that are on chain or specific uh, policies that are being created, such as um, um, adding methodologies to an allow list on the registry system or um, assigning certification or governing economic policy or you could sort of think about the things where do you want to abstract out financialized governance so so we sort of built a tool for that the other answer is sometimes you actually maybe what's a better question to ask is how do you ensure that the right stakeholders have stake um, also, so there, that's the sometimes we want people to have skin in the game and we want them to be represented and that to be also represented as voting power. 
um, for certain things. So it's sort of like a both and. There are certain things that that should be stripped away from and made just elegant governance tools that are not financialized. And then uh, in other cases, my answer to this would be, how do we include the right people as owners in the system so that they can um, vote and have power? Um, hi, Tony. I'm curious how you want us to use this. Do you, do you want us to go on the market and buy things? Do you want us to, like the organizations we're worked with, to start creating blockchain assets? That's a great question. I think there's multiple layers. So um, if you go to app.region.network right now, you'll see that there's a live marketplace. And that marketplace is populated with high quality carbon credits that came from a project called the City Forest Registry. So what's amazing is, and this, this didn't, um, this wasn't actually planned, but for instance, I went on today and I offset my family's last year of carbon on the marketplace. And I ended up doing that to a um, park outside of Issaquah, Washington, that I had played as a child that was deeded over to developers to get developed and then became part of this carbon project, got saved and turned into a sort of like climate park. It's amazing. It was kind of... So, so there's so there's opportunities, I guess, for individuals and and businesses to go and just sort of like engage with offsetting in a in the retail sort of way, but also there's opportunities for project developers to be engaging. There's opportunities for people who have a vision for new forms of value, biodiversity or water, to be engaging and thinking how do we you know, study, monitor, report, and create a new unit of account, a new eco credit. And so I think we're, you know, I tend to be more geeky and passionate personally about the desire to really create a strong community of different individuals and businesses and communities who are saying, what is really important for us to, to generate assets out of and to bring on our balance sheet in order to flow money where and attention where it needs to go, right? But then there's the other side of that, which is sort of like the, the demand side, the marketplace, like people coming and saying, hey, I would like to offset my carbon or I would like to protect biodiversity in the Amazon. So I think there's multiple levels that I would love to see people engaging in. Let us quickly add there that hopefully, we, I mean, not hopeful, but maybe we can get to a stage where just by using a certain token, just by using let's say, a, a stable coin that's pegged to, to the dollar that's backed by nature just by using that coin you're helping out. And we'll also add it's easy to be um, jaded, especially when we – I love John Oliver, but he did our industry no favors with um, something that is a really complex, nuanced topic. And there are a lot of amazing projects that are trying desperately to save ecosystems and to do good. And the best thing that all of you can do, aside from um, financially contributing to those projects, is to stay open and curious to everything that's happening. Don't close down, because we need all of us in our different roles to participate.